laser industry specifically. It has changed dramatically. The field of biophotonics was just getting started. The first instrument that I bought was a microwave spectrum analyzer. It's time to shed light on our universe. This is All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light. Join us as we explore the latest in lasers, optics, spectroscopy, and microscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape. We're brought to you by Photonics Media. This is Associate Editor Joel Williams. Here are this week's top stories. Postdoc encased researchers developed a method for achieving near unity efficiency of the spin hall effect of light. The collaborators used an artificially designed metasurface capable of transmitting most light of one polarization at near unity and reflecting light from the other. The method could improve the performance of microscopic optical devices. Uppsala University researchers, in collaboration with graphene materials company Graphmatech, demonstrated a method for lowering the reflectivity of copper powder by adding a graphene coating. According to Graphmatech CEO Mamoun Taher, the researchers were able to reduce the reflectance by up to 67%. The work could lead to more densely printed parts through laser additive manufacturing. An advancement to smart window technology incorporates luminescent solar concentrators into window or window pane designs. A team from Rice University's Brown School of Engineering designed its windows by placing a conjugated polymer between two clear acrylic panels. The integrated photovoltaic technology hopes to mediate energy generation and efficiency challenges faced in building designs. Researchers from the University of Jena have developed a method called coherence tomography with extreme ultraviolet light, abbreviated as XCT. The technique enables study of interior structures of semiconductor materials non-destructively and has applications in data processing and materials research. And finally, researchers from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University developed a miniaturized, highly sensitive optical fiber sensor that could be used to measure small pressure changes within the body, changes as minute as 2 kilopascals. The sensor is made from a polymer called Xeonex, and its basis for operation is a fiber brag grating, periodic microstructures that can be inscribed onto a fiber. Up next, news editor Jake Saltzman speaks with Natalie Piquet of the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics. I'm Joel Williams, and you're listening to All Things Photonics. Today's episode is sponsored by Comsol, the leading developer of multi-physics simulation software, which includes tools for building and deploying simulation apps. Comsol's wave and ray optics capabilities are used for modeling, imaging, and sensing in consumer electronics and biotechnology, information processing and communication systems, and more. See how the Comsol software fits your optical analysis needs at www.comsol.com. We are thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Natalie Peake from the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics, where she is a scientist in the Emeritus Group Laser Spectroscopy. She leads her own esteemed research group, working throughout spectroscopic techniques and applications with a focus on frequency comb spectroscopy. Natalie is the recipient of the 2021 Gettner Kastner Prize from the German Physical Society and the French Physical Society. She's a previous winner of the Koblenz Award from the Koblenz Society and the 2010 Beller Award from the American Physical Society. Hello, Natalie. Hello, Jake. Thank you for being on with us. I, I want to get into a, a question that has to do with our world um, right now here in the present. You know, one of the themes due to the global pandemic has been on enhanced communication and communication technology. And, and to be sure, uh, in industry, in optics, for example, we've seen optics and materials companies really move aggressively into this space, be it with optical fibers or, or other telecommunications applications. Um, for you, in terms of the technologies and applications in which you are working, frequency comb communication, how have developments in optical tools and components uh, changed in 2020? 
Yeah, for us, um, well, we are really in basic research, so we don't really work in, in telecommunication, but we strongly rely on uh, tools that have been previously developed for telecommunications. And um, actually, we did not see, at, at our scale, we did not see any big changes. We did not see any new tools uh, particularly valuable this year. Uh, what has been uh, actually even more difficult is that, uh, of course, the contact with the companies have been more complicated because most of us work from home and the company people also, uh, because the lead times uh, uh, have been uh, stretched incredibly. So, yeah, for us, it has, we have seen mostly negative aspects and we did not see really any any new tools or any new ideas emerging from commercial offers. And look at your citations and areas of research that one would, would, would encounter just preparing for this kind of an interview, for example. It's really a tour through different methods of spectroscopy. We, we talk about molecular, dual comb, Raman, broadband, more. A lot of times we hear that those who are working in optics and photonics are, are, are talking about a solution without a problem. Uh, the laser, for example, is, has been described this way. Uh, I want to ask you, how do you approach new research and make decisions about the technologies and the techniques that your work is going to necessitate? Yeah, actually, I think the expression a solution without a problem applies very well to our work. We, my main uh, driving uh, motivation is uh, uh, to try to come up with new ideas and then to be open and to see whether they are promising or not. So... Um, yeah, most of the time, uh, when I have an idea which pops up a little bit uh, randomly, mostly when I have time to take a little bit of distance, so that's not necessarily in a, in a work context. And then I will, uh, I will just try to explore a little bit the idea on my own to make some simple calculations or some preliminary experiments to see whether it's really an idea or whether it's not, uh, not something to explore. Uh, then I will try to look if other people already had the same idea, and most of the time uh, it stops here because indeed uh, other people already uh, did it. Uh, I mean that's it has become rather hard to come up with an, an with something that uh, that has not been already explored by by others. And for for me that's uh, I mean if other people have done it or are currently doing it, it means that it's not interesting. We should just let them pursue and try to to find something else. And if it turns out that it's promising and that it has not been explored uh, by others, uh, then I will discuss with my group and see whether uh, uh, some people are interested and uh, are willing to try to perform an experiment. And then we try to perform some very simple proof of, uh, of principle experiment that enable us to appreciate whether it has a potential or not. And uh, depending whether it has or not, we re-evaluate and it can bec become a bigger project or it can become uh, a little publication without any follow-up uh, follow work. So I would say we have some uh, general long-term objectives, but we also try to be very open-minded on a day-to-day -day basis to new insights, new ideas. And um, the, the research work which impresses me the, the most is uh, when you see a work which has been published and that it looks obvious to you. That uh, you think, but how come that, that's only now that one comes up with something like this because it's so simple. And uh, actually, in general, when you get into the details, it turns out that it is not so simple, yeah. uh, but that because it was a good idea, at the end, it, it looks simple. And I, I think if I could come up with, a, with an idea like this, then I would have been successful in my career. Max Planck, quantum optics, Dr. Uh, Natalie Peak is with us on all things photonics. And you raised a couple points there. And one of those, uh, I want to go back to the first question. It's this aspect of networking uh, challenges, particularly in, in 2020. And, and it, offline, we were speaking of a particularly fascinating approach you have to, to conferences and workshops. And it's this interdisciplinary approach. Can you sort of walk us through your mindset when you're, you're speaking and potentially even working with others who may not be in the same areas as yourself? Well, now when I, when I attend a conference, I really try to go to talks from fields where I am totally ignorant <laughs> in order to, to, to try to learn a little bit. And what I can learn is extremely varied. Uh, I can learn about a technical tool, 
that is not widespread in my field and then uh, but which might be useful or i can use about uh, a measurement technique or i can learn about some motivations of people in other fields that can inspire me and recently in in recent years when i attended conferences i, I tried to give a, a big proportion of the of attendance to to really fields where uh, where i don't know much in order to to learn a little bit more so of course when i was a, a doctoral student or a, a postdoc i was not doing this i was primarily going into my field and i i'm still of course following very closely the work by others in my field and discussing with colleagues and attending their talks and so on but i like also to hear about things which give me the feeling that i am discover that i am discovering something that i am learning something and so far it has been i think rather successful that i hear something and then a few years later i remember yeah in this conference there was somebody saying this and then i look in my notes i see the names and uh, i find out that uh, what they were doing it would be very timely if we could try to do it in our field and that it would bring something so i i like really to to learn about new things you authored a, moving into your work now, uh, per se, you authored a paper for the 2020 Frontiers in Optics and Laser Science Conference, uh, and it was called Frequency Coma Spectroscopy Stop or Go, uh, and it was also the title of your plenary at that, that conference. In the paper's abstract, you and, and co-authors introduce how frequency combs have, quote, revolutionized time and fre frequency metrology. Uh, I'm wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and share some of the, the recent progress you and others have made. Uh, in this area. Yes, yeah, so perhaps I, I should uh, first explain a little bit what is a frequency comb, that's Please. perhaps not clear for, for your audience. So frequency comb is a, is a tool that has been, uh, that has become really powerful in the late 90s uh, and initially it has been developed for frequency metrology. And uh, a frequency comb is a, a spectrum which is made of millions of laser lines uh, which are equidistant in the, in the frequency space and which is phase coherent. And initially, the, the frequency comb was developed for frequency metrology. One should say that in frequency metrology, so what people want to measure is uh, the frequency of, uh, of uh, an optical transition or a, a laser light source extremely precisely. And in the optical domain, it's very difficult to, to do. It was actually not possible uh, before the advent of the, of the frequency comb because optical frequencies oscillate extremely quickly and right. there is no electronic apparatus which can, uh, which can measure that. And uh, the frequency comb, the idea in a frequency comb is that it can be used as a, an optical ruler so that instead of measuring directly the optical frequency of interest, you measure it relative to one comb line uh, by measuring bit notes. And then you, you measure in the radio frequency range where people know how to, to make, how to make very precise measurements. And so this, in, uh, this has been demonstrated in the, in the late 90s. Uh, and it, it has been really a revolution because it made it possible to measure in an absolute manner uh, the frequency of any optical light source. And starting from this, there have been really a lot of uh, applications in the field of frequency metrology. For instance, the frequency comb has been the key to the development of optical clocks, uh, which may redefine uh, the way we, uh, we consider the second. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very important. But simultaneously, there are people from other fields who found out that a frequency comb was really an amazing light source because eventually that's equivalent to a million of CW lasers that would all emit in the same, in the same beam from the same box uh, in a phase coherent manner. And there are a lot of people who have found out that uh, it may be a tool that would be enabling for other applications. And I was part of these people. And for me, my field was uh, the field of uh, broadband spectroscopy. And when I learned about uh, uh, the frequency comb, I thought, well, this is uh, obviously a light source that could be useful for, uh, for uh, high resolution spectroscopy for measuring, uh, instead of measuring very, very precisely the frequency of one uh, laser light, uh, could one measure a very broad spectrum simultaneously? And how precise can it, can it be? 
So that's the reason why we, we got involved uh, with this uh, topic of exploring the potential of frequency comps for, uh, for broadband spectroscopy. And that's how we came up with the, with the scheme of, of dual comp spectroscopy. And it turned out that, uh, so this started more than 15 years ago. And it turned out that we have been from surprises to surprises. And that the more we, we dig into this work, uh, the more we have interesting questions and the more we have the feeling that there is an exciting potential and this potential is somewhat predictable uh, on the one side uh, I think that it may be possible to somehow merge frequency metrology together with broadband spectroscopy uh, so this is something which is uh, exciting us uh, really a lot at the moment and we are trying to find out how far we can push the precision and the accuracy of our broadband spectroscopy I just want to take us deeper into your your uh, recent and current work, and you know, you mentioned that even though the initial function for laser frequency combs was frequency metrology, there are really a diverse range of spectroscopic applications that are across the full length of the spectrum, and, and they show how they're benefiting from these combs, as you say. Can you just talk about some of the recent applications in your work in general that we are seeing for laser frequency combs? I know you have a couple of ongoing projects there. Yeah, so what um, in my group, what has been uh, uh, really interesting to us are um, applications of frequency comps to interferometry and to spectroscopy. And a scheme that has been uh, particularly interesting to us is the scheme of the dual comb interferometer, uh, which can be used for uh, spectroscopy and for other interferometry applications. So perhaps before explaining some very recent developments, perhaps I can explain try to explain a little bit what is a dual comb interferometer. Yes, I may have skipped a skip there, please. Okay, so a dual comb interferometer is essentially uh, the fact that we have two frequency combs, uh, so two independent comb generators, two laser boxes that we make interfere in the time domain, and we use this interference pattern to produce interesting measurements. So one can explain it uh, perhaps easily in, in the frequency domain, uh, even without a slide. Uh, in the frequency domain, so the frequencies are oscillating very, very quickly. Uh, we, we don't know how to count them directly. But if we beat two laser lines, which have very uh, similar frequencies, then we will generate a signal that will oscillate at the difference in frequency between these two light sources. Uh, and that's what we call a bit note. So now if we have two frequency combs, we can uh, arrange them in such a manner that the interference between two combs will generate multiple bit notes, and that uh, these bit notes between pairs of comb lines, one from each comb, generate a third comb, but now this third comb is, is in, the frequent, in the radio frequency domain, where we know very well how to, how to count frequencies. So what we do is that actually we use these two combs to down convert the optical frequencies to the radio frequency domain, where we know very well how to, to count them. We make our uh, measurement in the, in the radio frequency domain, and then a posteriori we can get back to the optical domain. And it turns out that what I am explaining in probably a manner which is not very clear, uh, one can uh, make an analogy that it works exactly like a Michelson interferometer, uh, which path difference would be scanned, except that there are no moving parts. And producing an interferometer uh, without moving parts turns out to be very interesting for spectroscopy, but also for uh, ranging uh, or for Actually, one can also think about optical coherence tomography or any applications that would use two beam uh, two beam interference. So, in um, in the work of my of my group, we have been mostly interested in spectroscopy uh, because it mimics the Fourier transform spectrometer, which is a, a tool which is very broadly used uh, in uh, chemistry and in biology for measuring uh, measuring spectra. That's something which is commercially available and which is totally turnkeys for decades. Uh, and so, we are doing the same uh, with all the advantages of the commercial instruments, but some additional advantages, uh, which are that there are no moving parts, that we use laser light source so we can get a shorter measurement time or a better signal to noise ratio. We can get a higher resolution and uh, we can get a higher accuracy 
due to the fact that we are uh, using the frequency comb. And so that's a general topic uh, where we have been uh, working uh, in, the, in the past years. So a lot of work has been, uh, has been done to simply have the technique working uh, because uh, on the paper it's very appealing, but technically it's much more involved and we had to come up with some tricks because there were a lot of difficulties that we had not foreseen in the beginning. And now we are at a point where we actually master rather well the instrument and where we discover that actually there are applications that we had not foreseen in the beginning and which seem very promising uh, and which uh, some of these applications go beyond the traditional spectroscopy uh, that was previously accessible. And so for instance, I can uh, mention a very, a very recent work that, that we have done and uh, we, we have just submitted the, the paper for publication. So we are very, uh, very eager to see how, how the community will uh, react, which is that now we apply our dual comb interferometer to holography. So holography is another uh, interference technique, Absolutely. Uh, which is rather unfashioned at the moment. Yeah. It's associated with uh, three-dimensional measurements, also with uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, displays, things like that. Uh, and for us, we, we, we are applying it to three-dimensional uh, measurements, uh, where essentially we, we send one comb uh, on the object that we want to, to analyze, and then we interfere it uh, with, uh, with the, the second comb. Uh, so that's, uh, and we, we measure the interference pattern, not on a single photodetector, but on a camera. And then uh, we analyze this uh, spatial interference pattern in order to reconstruct our object. And so the system, it really looks exactly similar to what people are doing normally for holography. But the difference is that we use a comb source. So we don't have one laser line or a couple of laser lines. We have thousands of laser lines at the moment. And ultimately, we should have millions of laser lines, which means that to holography, we essentially add the spectral dimension. So there are some obvious advantages, which are that uh, we, we can in make some spectroscopy diagnostic in addition to reconstructing uh, the, the three-dimensional three profile of, of the object. Uh, so that uh, if the object would uh, absorb some light uh, at, some, uh, at some place, uh, we would see it in addition to, to, to know, uh, to know the, the profile of the object. So that's already something interesting. And now the, what we are trying to explore is also well, the fact that we have all these laser lines uh, simultaneously. Can it be a way to enhance the precision and the accuracy of holography? And could we, well, what are the, what are the frontiers uh, of, the, of the precision of the measurement? And for instance, could we measure a, an object that would have uh, dimensions which are on the several meter scale? Could we measure this locally with a nanometer precision? Uh, so this is still an open question, but that's what is exciting us at, uh, at the moment. Uh, and that's rather interesting because when we started this, we had actually absolutely no knowledge about holography. Uh, it was one of these ideas which popped up and uh, we decided just to, well, I, I, I had a student who, with who I discussed this idea and he was extremely enthusiastic. And so he decided, uh, yeah, let's try it. And uh, none of us had any knowledge in holography and it turned out that we have a result that we find rather exciting. And now we are curious to, uh, to see how much we can, uh, we can push them. And that's actually uh, something which is a rather applied project, which could uh, uh, become an instrument or we perhaps might become a, a, commercial, a commercial device, at least which, uh, which touches many, many applications. And in the meantime, we have uh, uh, other projects uh, which are much more dealing with fundamental physics and where essentially we would like to perform spectroscopy and essentially molecular spectroscopy, so spectroscopy of small molecules with a very good precision for test of fundamental physics. And so there are already a lot of people who are doing uh, spectroscopy of small molecules with, uh, with an excellent precision. Uh, what we, we would like to, to bring compared to what these people are doing is that we, we want to uh, have an excellent precision together with a broad spectral bandwidth simultaneously. 
so that we can interrogate uh, several transitions simultaneously. And this would be uh, interesting for getting a, a better insight on the, on the structure of, uh, of molecule, uh, for uh, also improving uh, quantum calculations which enable to predict uh, the structure of, of small molecules and so it would be a way to test theories and perhaps it might be a way to uh, to see if uh, if some to redefine some constants or to see if they have variations with times so it touches at very fundamental physics even if at the moment we are really uh, uh, progressing very very slowly into this project talk about a, a number of technologies there and, and each one more fascinating than the next uh, you know but I suppose that you can't fully ignore something as basic as the supply chain and I want to ask you um, uh, especially now but but in general uh, what are some of the challenges in sourcing frequency combs that are capable of supporting your work yeah there are um, really a lot of challenges and um, I think our work is strongly technology perhaps not limited but uh, is oriented by the available technology um, for instance, a few years ago, when we uh, when we st uh, started to work very seriously uh, on uh, on this dual comb spectroscopy, well, it was obvious that because it has a broad spectral bandwidth, it was interesting to go in regions where the spectroscopy of molecules would be very relevant. And so, when one speak of spectroscopy of molecules, that's mostly uh, the mid infrared spectral regions and the ultraviolet region, and it turned out that the frequency comb technology was not uh, available in either of these regions. So we had to develop uh, the, the technology. Uh, so sometimes we develop the technology by assembling things which are commercially available. Uh, sometimes we do some de original developments uh, ourselves. Sometimes we collaborate with other research groups which may have an expertise uh, in something that, uh, that we need. For the, the technology of, um, so I think one of the first challenge is to have frequency combs which emit in regions which are of interest for the for the publication for the, the applications, for the targeted applications, and so as far as molecular spectroscopy is concerned, there has been really a lot of progress in recent years by many groups in the mid infrared spectral region. And so one can fairly say that now there are some tools which enable to start working seriously in, uh, in these regions. Uh, but the, for instance, in the ultraviolet region, mm. which is which is very complementary to the mid infrared region, because one can in the mid infrared region one can access, access uh, vibration rotation transitions in molecules, whereas in in the ultraviolet region that's more electronic transitions in molecules. The ultraviolet region is also very important for precision spectroscopy because uh, that's at in a higher frequency range, so potentially one can be more accurate. And uh, the ultraviolet region, which is traditionally very involved for spectroscopic instrumentation and for laser instrumentation, is still uh, not e easy to reach uh, by frequency comb techniques. So I would say one of the first difficulties is to have simply the frequency comb which is uh, emitting in the, in the range of interest. And then there are many other parameters. For instance, so the, the frequency comb is, uh, is made, is a, is a comb of laser lines. And the, the frequency spacing between the laser lines is a, is a key parameter uh, for us because it essentially gives the resolution that we can get in a single measurement. And so we, ideally, we would like to have combs that can span over a, a, a very uh, large range of uh, repetition of uh, repetition frequency parameter of line spacing parameter and in practice uh, that's not possible to get in most frequency comb sources the line spacing is fixed because the frequency comb is generated by a laser oscillators so it's uh, fixed or uh, very uh, very poorly tunable and let's say the, the frequency combs which are commercially available uh, currently have a line spacing which is on the order of uh, a few hundreds of megahertz. So if one wants a frequency comb like, like this, one can find it commercially available. But if you want a frequency comb of very large repetition frequency, like uh, uh, several tens of gigahertz, 
Or, Frequency Comb of Very Small Repetition Frequency, like 1 MHz, uh, it's not commercially available. And so, there are uh, some groups who are, uh, whose research is to develop uh, this type of, of technology. Uh, we are also doing this uh, in my group. But it's sure that then, of course, we spend a lot of time on the technology development and uh, it slows down the, the scientific uh, development properly. So I think uh, because of the increasing number of applications, uh, what people call a frequency comb has really changed a lot. And each application has its uh, particular requirement. And it's sure that at the moment there is really uh, room for uh, a lot of new products that could help scientists in, the, in their research. Natalie Peak, uh, kind enough to join us on all things photonics, and, and many of the solutions to the work that your group is working on currently uh, involve lasers and, and laser-based systems, and, and particularly, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, fiber-based and solid-state femtosecond lasers. Uh, and you mentioned in your session at the EPIC online technology meeting on photonic systems for high-end research uh, this fall that electrical optic modulation remains a very active application as well. What are some of the advantages to working with electro optics for, for, for your work? Yeah, so it's true that most of our work is done with uh, fiber lasers or solid state lasers. They are extremely powerful uh, because they can be extremely stable. They have a broad span. Uh, usually they have a high output power or high peak power, which means that one can efficiently convert the light into over spectral region by nonlinear frequency conversion. So they are really, I think for dual comb interferometry application, they are the most powerful tool, uh, but they are also rather complicated to use. And so what we appreciate with the electro-optic modulators is that, let's say, we can get a set of commercially available devices that we assemble in our own way, and then which very quickly works in a turnkey manner. And so that's very important because, well, for instance, for a student who is starting, uh, that's a good way to, to start and to have him understand progressively what are the, the difficulties uh, of the experiment. So with this type of experiment, the student can become autonomous uh, rather quickly. And that also, uh, I, I find the, the, the big advantage that I see in electro-optic modulators is that they, they really, uh, we can reconfigure our experiment very quickly. And this enables us to change the parameters. Uh, for instance, I was speaking about the, the repetition frequency. And with an electro-optic modulator, you can set it simply uh, by dialing a number on a, on a synthesizer. So uh, that's uh, really contrary to what I was saying. You can choose the repetition frequency exactly as you like. Uh, so the price to pay for this is that you have much less comb line than uh, with, a, with a fiber laser. But I, I really appreciate uh, this flexibility because I think that's really key to exploring new ideas. And so if we have a, a crazy idea, we can implement it with the electro-optic modulators and then we, we realize uh, how to improve the idea, uh, what, is, uh, what had been neglected and what should be taken into account uh, in the experiment. Or we can simply find out that the idea is not a good idea and that we, we should forget about all this. And we can do this on a, uh, on a very short time scale, uh, which really brings a lot of flexibility. Uh, so I think that's what I, I, I appreciate most with electro-optic modulators. I also think that because of this flexibility, if one was willing to, to develop a field instrument or to develop a commercial instrument that would have to be used by people uh, who have absolutely no knowledge uh, of, the, of the technique, uh, it might be the, the right tool to start with because what I observe with my new group members is that they can really become efficient with this type of setups extremely quickly. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you, in the last part of that answer there, you, you brought up the, the end user and it gets into something very interesting. Um, you said also at the Epic Online Technology meeting uh, in November that you and your group are always motivated by the application. And yet for, for an end user, there's obviously such a gap between the, the research and the instrumentation stages of the work uh, and actual end user implementation. When you're in the lab working or you're even at a conference, you know, a, a approaching your work, are you thinking at all about the end user and what an end user must know about a given technology? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so absolutely not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we are really on the on the research side, and what we we are trying to to really do is to come up with new ideas and to find out which ideas are, are really are really uh, are really promising. Um, so I I think um, that's really a different job, and uh, we we really. Do not, so sometimes we have collaborators, of course, uh, who are a bit like end users, but we, we, don't, we don't try to make things uh, of easy access outside our group. And actually, most of the time, one setup is really the setup of one person. And when the student or the postdoc leave, sometimes a lot of tricks are, are lost uh, at this point. So it's sure that we, we are totally disconnected. We are uh, very largely disconnected from the, from the applications and we are mostly, uh, mostly driven by the research, uh, by exploring new ideas and uh, improving fundamental science. And I think that it's sure that it's very important also to that the, that the instrument and that the, uh, the technology products of our research become accessible to, to other people and ideally to uh, people from different fields. But I think it would uh, become the, the mission or, of either uh, research institute who are uh, much more in applied research and who try to make a gap between uh, research and industry. Uh, like in Germany, we have uh, Fraunhofer Institute, which, which have this goal. Or it could be uh, the, the objective of a startup. For instance, if I had a, a student or a, a postdoc who was willing to, uh, to try to open uh, a spin-off company, I think it would be very timely and very exciting. And then I think uh, one would have to pay into account, of course, uh, how to, to speak to, to end users and how to target applications that are really interesting to other people. We are mostly driven by our own applications. You know, the startup mindset is something that's very interesting as well, because everyone seems to have a, a different take on it. You know, some people are very much drawn to the idea of starting up and others are, you know, more into the, the theoretical research approach. For you, I mean, you've mentioned it when we were talking a bit just now about holography, for example. If the opportunity presents itself, what's your, uh, your view of a startup? I mean, is that a direction that you've considered going or, or maybe want to go? Well, I have um, a lot of uh, admiration for uh, for people who, who start a spin-off company, and I think it must be very exciting because I have the feeling that a lot of new things uh, can happen, and that now research is also leaving the ground of academic labs, and one see more and more re exciting research with, which is done at companies. So, for me personally, at the moment, I'm really I really have a passion for the, the research that uh, that I am doing, and my my feeling is uh, that I. I already don't have enough time uh, to explore all the topics that I would like to, to explore and that I, I don't have enough time to learn all the things that uh, where I would like to understand a little bit. Uh, I would like, for instance, to, to dig a little bit more into biology and chemistry applications because I find it must be really exciting to have more interdisciplinary knowledge. Uh, so at the moment, I'm really focused on, uh, on fundamental research. Uh, now, I think that perhaps one day uh, I will think that uh, it's enough and that, uh, that I would like to, to experience something else. And then I, I think uh, working, uh, uh, working in a company and uh, founding a startup uh, would certainly be something that would appeal, that would appeal to me. So that's, uh, that's clearly an idea that I keep in mind for the future. So I think that Either if I had, right now, if I had a, a, one of my co-workers who, who was willing to start this adventure, uh, I would be willing to, to support and to help a little bit for a little fraction of my time. Uh, but right now, I feel uh, clearly should not be my, uh, my main uh, my main uh, occupation, but I don't know, perhaps in 10 years, 15 years, uh, that's certainly something which, uh, which appeals to me. Well, I appreciate you taking uh, some time of your very busy schedule to, to join us, Natalie. I got one more question for you, and it's a forward-looking question. I just want to ask you, uh, you know, what's on the horizon for you here in, in 2021? Is there anything particularly exciting that you'd like to share with our, with our listeners here? We are really uh, pushing very far our research about uh, dual comb spectroscopy. Uh, so we are uh, collecting new results uh, around the imaging and things like that. 
and so I think uh, people uh, may see some uh, some Im impressive images uh, and some impressive uh, spectroscopy results coming from our group uh, very recently uh, in, in the very recent fu future. And uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, I think everybody uh, is struggling uh, to produce a little bit of work. And with the pandemic situation, that's very difficult for everybody. Uh, so I have a fantastic team, uh, which is uh, uh, very motivated, uh, who is very motivated and who produces a, a fantastic work. Uh, but I, I must say that it's, uh, it's, very, it's very challenging to, to everybody. And for instance, we were mentioning uh, the aspect of networking. I told you, yeah, when I go to conferences, I like to hear about uh, the work of other people and at the moment one cannot meet with other people and it's sure that it totally changes uh, the, the way we, we perform research. Uh, on the one hand this online conference is maybe useful for uh, enabling people who in principle could not attend the conference for instance because it's too expensive or it's too far away so with these online conferences it makes uh, uh, the science more accessible to these people and that's really great especially for students uh, but on the other hand it's uh, it's sure that the interaction with colleagues is something which is usually very fruitful and very stimulating and so I hope that uh, towards the end of 2021, we can uh, resume a little bit. Well, obviously, our, our way of working will have changed, but I, I hope that we can resume our uh, physical interactions, try to brainstorm with other people. is, is something which is uh, one of the pleasures in, uh, in, this, in this work. Absolutely. Well, Natalie, thank you for, for uh, taking some time here to, to join us on All Things Photonics. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. It was a, a very stimulating experience. In the first half of our two-part interview with UCLA's Aidan Ozjan, Dr. Ozjan introduced our listeners to his recently published work, Terahertz Pulse Shaping Using Diffractive Surfaces. As he and his co-authors write in their abstract, at the intersection of machine learning and optics, diffractive networks merge wave optics with deep learning to design task-specific elements to all optically perform various tasks, such as object classification and machine vision. In this portion of our interview, Dr. Ozjan, like this week's featured guest, explores opportunities for innovation in holography. The interview explores the influence of deep learning on various methods of computational imaging touching upon quantitative phase imaging in biophotonic applications, including histopathology. Here again is Jake Saltzman with part two of our interview with Adan Ozjan. In the introduction of the paper, you and your co-authors discuss how, how training sophisticated neural networks on data has, quote, set the state of the art performance for various applications, uh, one of those being holography. In general, what opportunities do you see deep learning uh, establishing for holography? I think deep learning in general has been impacting computational imaging with various new capabilities enabled by data-driven, essentially, training methods and deep learning methods. And within computational imaging, I believe holography is one of the first and foremost areas of imaging that uh, has been impacted tremendously with deep learning methods. There are several different important advances that deep learning has brought into holographic microscopy. The first one that I can uh, share with you is actually phase retrieval and holographic image reconstruction. Holography encodes the three-dimensional information of, of a scene in the form of an intensity-only recording. And a critical step for a hologram to be reconstructed is the phase retrieval step. Oftentimes, this has been done iteratively using various different algorithms, methods in the literature. Deep learning has uh, fundamentally changed that. Using image data, we can now reconstruct holograms without any iterations in a single pass through within a trained network to take uh, these intensity only recordings and convert them into a, a complex image phase and amplitude of the scene, the micro scale even. And that's where I think one of the first uh, important contributions of deep learning on holography has been phase retrieval and holographic image reconstruction. 
along the same lines, we have seen how deep learning has been extending the depth of field of holography, performing autofocusing and phase retrieval, retrieval at the same time, so that, for example, a volumetric sample can be brought into focus all at once, uh, phase recovered and autofocus in a single neural net. So you can actually embed within different types of network architectures, different functions that you want to see at the end of the reconstruction. On top of all of this, a very, very exciting opportunity that we have seen surface through deep learning methods is how holograms can be transformed into the image quality of other uh, microscopy modalities. We call them cross-modality image transformations, which means you take, for example, a hologram and reconstruct it with the uh, image contrast, color contrast, and resolution of a bright field microscope. This is very, very difficult to establish a forward model because holography is single frequency oftentimes and it's uh, spatially and temporally coherent, at least partially coherent, and bright field is just the opposite, broadband and incoherent. So, but through data, through image data, you can establish actually a relationship in the forward model and, and take holograms and reconstruct them at the output as if it's coming from a bright field microscope. This means a single hologram now can be virtually uh, propagated to different parts of the sample volume and each cross section looks like basically a bright field high numerical aperture microscope. We call this best of both worlds in the sense that you get the beautiful axial uh, contrast resolution and speckle free image of a bright field microscope, but you also get the advantage of holography in the sense that you can scan through a sample with a single hologram and get this beautiful 3D imaging all digitally performed. Another very important application of the same cross-modality image transformation has been in uh, quantitative phase imaging, QPI, where you take holograms and transform them into, uh, uh, for example, uh, a stained image of a sample, especially important for histopathology applications where you take, for example, a label-free tissue sample, image it with a hologram, get uh, a quantitative phase image, and transform those uh, images into bright field equivalent images of the same tissue samples, but stained versions of them with the, with the chromophores that are used in histopathology. This is actually a very exotic transformation that's enabled by deep learning. It takes holograms and transforms them into bright field, but at the same time, it does the transformation from label-free to labeled images, which is, which is to me fascinating. I don't know, I was John with us, and I want to wrap up with a question um, that explores your session at the 2020 International Conference on Computing and, and Data Science, and you talk about the ability to train diffractive layers for electronic neural networks, and the potential here uh, is the ability to form something that you described as a superset to lenses. Can you talk about some of the distinct types of neural network-powered systems that are deriving from that capability in particular? Sure. I, I think uh, diffractive surfaces that are engineered to work with a certain focal plane array, an image sensor array, and a backhand uh, electronic neural net. This is essentially how uh, you can design task-specific imaging and sensing systems, where instead of uh, having a simple lens that projects an image of, of a scene onto a CMOS image or a CCD or any kind of focal plane array and then acting on it, we think the front end should also be smart. Front end should not just do an arbitrary image, pixel to pixel mapping and image translation. It should actually do some computation with, with the fact that it's going to pass that information to a, an electronic neural net. We call this task specific design where everything is learnable and jointly trainable, meaning that the diffractive layers, the features on these diffractive layers the focal plane array itself in terms of number of pixels, pixel size, pixel architecture, and the backend electronic neural net, all of them form a jointly trainable uh, system that's uh, task specific. And depending on the task, you, you train them. This is a superset to uh, uh, lenses in the sense that 
A diffractive network, of course, can do a, a simple lens function, but it can do more and it can simplify the design of this task-specific computational system, whether it's machine learning or doing a specific computational imaging task. What are the advantages of this kind of a holistic design? First and foremost, these are going to be extremely power efficient and high speed systems. You won't need as many pixels. You won't need as many uh, megapixels on the focal plane array. The electronic neural net can be extremely shallow. Uh, it can consume much less power because part of the computation will be done uh, all optically as the light is passing through. As a result, we're looking at extremely high speed, high frame rate, low power systems that will benefit from the task specific design of the optical front end, which delivers the information with maybe a much more limited number of pixels to an electronic neural net and they compute together. And I think uh, we will see more and more examples of this in machine vision, in computational imaging, and also in statistical inference uh, classification of images and all of these tasks that demand normally powerful computers, powerful GPUs, um, lower frame rates, and uh, large megapixels, we will see uh, a change in, in the requirements of these systems to be lighter, to be faster, to be low power, so that you can do actually these computations everywhere. Imagine actually inexpensive robotic systems where everywhere you can deploy these kinds of inexpensive systems to do a certain computation extremely frequently uh, at low power. So this is actually how we will benefit in the long run through task-specific design of these diffractive systems together with backhand electronic neural networks, also considering the focal plane array as a trainable feature. Terahertz Pulse Shaping Using Diffractive Services was published January 4th, 2021 in Nature Communications. Thank you, Dr. Ozjad, for being on with us. Thank you for having me. That does it for this episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to Joel Williams with the news. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pick us ideas, let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthings at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website. Subscribe, never miss an episode. I'm Jake Saltzman. This has been a Photonics Media Production.